Hello Elik30, this is Michael and we are in How to Be Human, an Autistic Man's Guide to Life by Jory Fleming. We are in the final chapter of the book, chapter 9, entitled One Word, Love. And we are on page 165, about halfway down the page. Um, there's this, the, the first uh, major paragraph and then we're starting right here where Lyric asks a question. LW, do you pray and what do you pray about? Jory, yes. At Oxford, I started going to morning prayer chapel services, which are at 8.15, because it's an interesting way to start the day. I enjoy it, even though I absolutely detest mornings normally. The Church of England is interesting as well, because it's more liturgical than other denominations I've been part of. In morning prayer, certain elements will always be the same, so you can get familiar and comfortable with them. There's one that talks about how the night has passed, the day lies open before us. It's just a factual statement, but it is interesting. The day does lie open before us. Being in England, it's often a cloudy, rainy day, but it's still a new day and anything can happen. You get reminded of useful tidbits like that an extra bonus. For myself, I tend to pray for my interactions with other people because it's something I'm concerned with because I'm not very good at it, and I know negative things can come from my poor performance. That's important for me. With prayer, you know you're not saying anything new if you are of the mind that your prayer is being heard. There's nothing new on the other hand of there's nothing new on the other end of the religious telephone line, so to speak. During prayer, I'll also try to think of other people and something that may be happening in their lives. The days are so busy. Oh. Let me start that over. The days are so busy that, horrible as it is, I might forget about things. One of the few things that my brain does automatically is prioritize information in terms of storage. So I find it hard to remember people's names and faces and things like that. But if somebody confides in me, something that they are concerned about. I want to remember because the next time I see them, I want to remember what they told me. And we had this interaction that was meaningful and not just say, how is the weather today, which is something that I don't like at all. To do that, I have to prioritize that information. If the day is busy, I don't have time to actively remember. So I pray for people because I care about them and want them to receive comfort, but also so that I can remember and try to override my subconscious prioritization that would deprioritize that human information. Because what I do all the time is take all this human information floating around and, for the most part, I redirect it and shunt it away so that I can function better. But there are times when you want to capture some of that information as well. LW You mentioned to me the scriptural mandate to protect the weak which is one of the tenets of Christianity and, in different ways, of other religions as well. How do you view that mandate? 
what does it look like through your eyes? Jury. I've been thinking about the stereotype that if you lack emotion, you're cold and calculating. But that perspective doesn't necessarily make me cold and calculating. Maybe it is, in fact, a better way to fulfill the scriptural mandate to protect the weak. Many people react emotionally to weakness. But the scriptural advice, not just from Christianity, but from other religions, is that the weak can have surprisingly different sources of strength. From my perspective, I'm weak in all sorts of ways, but I've been able to positively contribute. Part of problem solving is about understanding and presence, because I have witnessed instances where I have no solutions for any emotional problem, but I can try to understand, be present, and that is often an interaction which creates meaning. While I understand less, the fact that I observe more, the fact that I, in my small way, learn something each time, is really valuable for me and hopefully for other people as well. Sometimes the answer is not a solution, but just a presence or an attempt at understanding. I know other people have a better understanding than me, and that they have a really super advanced radar, whereas mine is terrible, but at least it's working hard all the time. Talking about a philosophy of life. Initially, this project was conceived as a memoir of Jory's mind and the story of what he has overcome and achieved. But as our conversations grew deeper, it evolved. The story became less about what Jory has done in spite of autism and more about who Jory is because of autism how he sees life, how he approaches it, how his perspective and inner compass came, came to be, are inseparable from his condition. To accurately convey jewelry, the talking, the back and forth, and the exchange of ideas became invaluable. I wanted to put readers in my shoes to ask questions you might ask, then listen and respond and reflect as you would. For Jory, I wanted to build the safe space that he finds missing to metaphorically get in my own boat and row as close to his island as I could. From this place, we found ourselves discussing not simply language and processing and the reading and misreading of emotion, but fundamental characteristics of what makes us, the nearly eight billion of us on planet Earth, human, and what might make us better as humans. A young man who struggles every day to understand people around him has pierced to the heart of some of the most fundamental dilemmas facing us in the 21st century. Have we considered the long-term consequences of embracing emotional drama and fervent rhetoric and allowing them to play such dominant roles? Have we given sufficient regard to the value and practice of critical thinking? Are we willing to make space for diversity of thought? A young man who is forced to husband his own mental energy has observed the rest of us and wonders if many of the things 
that we neurotypicals expend our brain energy on are superfluous or even harmful. Is it not better instead, he ventures, for each of us to commit from our own internal space to correcting the imbalances we see in the world? How might we begin to rebalance those imbalances? Much like his personality choice of ruthless optimism, Jory is a proponent of practical idealism. He advocates for smart people to do less thinking and more real-world problem-solving. As for managing the level of anger in our current debates, he proposes an autistic circuit-breaker for normal people. The title for this section, A Philosophy of Life, was chosen which, with much thought and care. In terms of personal burdens and challenges, life dealt Jory a very difficult hand. But then, for his next card, he drew an ace in the form of self-awareness. Let's pause there for a moment. Okay, the, um, the interviewer, Lyric Winnick, is using a, a metaphor from uh, from cards, from gambling, from poker. Uh, so um, life is the dealer of the card game, and Jory is the other player. So life dealt the cards, and Jory's cards uh, were hard to work with. Um, but then, you know, to you know. He, as in some card games, he was able to draw an additional card, and this card was an ace, which is a one. But, uh, but, but an ace represents the strongest. It, re re it represents a very, a very strong um, component in this hand, uh, this hand of cards that he has. So that's what she's saying. He started out with something that was weak and hard to use, but then he drew something that was potentially very strong when he drew the ace. An ace in the form of self-awareness. Continuing on, that awareness is his gift to share as many of us search for ways to navigate an even more fractured society. When Jory speaks of how you, me, each of us has the internal stability to be able to stand against the tide of the world. This thoughtful man who relies on leg braces knows exactly how hard it is to remain upright amid the buffeting waves and constantly shifting sands. Okay, pause again. Now she's using a new metaphor. Her metaphor here is from uh, from the ocean of uh, the tide of the world this is the the ocean tide uh coming against us and trying to push us uh, a certain direction and uh, how hard it is to to stand and keep your balance and be firm while you have this um this body of water coming toward you and pushing against you Continuing, Jory, there is a phrase that I've heard which I think is very appropriate here. Too often, emotion-based conversations devolve into throwing dirt. But throwing dirt is not helpful because not only do you get your hands dirty, but you are losing ground. You aren't making positive progress towards something. You are just throwing back more emotional words in someone else's face. No one is learning or improving their understanding of a problem. I listen to people say that vaccines cause autism or things like that. It's hard to understand their fear, so I would try to ask questions. 
Are you afraid of me? Why is that? When I get people to question a premise and then turn, turn on some semblance of critical thinking, it reverses. For a good number of people, it is possible to reverse the effects of mass manipulation. The real solution would be to teach people critical thinking in school. Everything about society is set up to avoid critical thinking and to get you sucked into a routine and ideology-based groups that make things comfortable for you. Critical thinking is often very uncomfortable, at least in my opinion. You have to reevaluate yourself, which means that, heaven forbid, you might be wrong sometimes. Most people don't like neutral. They want you to have an opinion. And I've always been of the mind that opinions are only useful if you're willing to change them very rapidly. I feel like the stronger your opinion, the weaker you should hold it. Mom will tell you that I am strongly opinionated, but I would say that I do actually change my mind on things. I am quite curious about the other side of an argument. In a lot of cases, people think that means you have no values. But that's just people confusing values and opinions. A value is something that has to be tied to philosophy and systems and ethics, whereas an opinion can be more emotional and tied on to your individual assessment of a situation, which could be correct or could be wrong. And we'll stop this video here.